Okay, good yeah. evening and thank you. Um, we, we were oversubscribed for this uh, webinar and we're delighted to have you all with us. Welcome to the second virtual version of UJA's Now You Know Speaker Series, co-sponsored by the Jewish Foundation. We are extremely grateful for everybody's support as we take stock and determine both the immediate and the long-term needs that will allow us to come through this crisis together. Our community has risen to the challenge. We have had more than 1,800 volunteers engaged in UJA's COVID-19 relief efforts, including 500 callers reaching out to every member of our community. To date, we have made more than 13,000 calls. We have another 150 volunteers purchasing and delivering groceries to the most vulnerable among us. We have packed and delivered 1,700 food boxes to ensure everyone in our community can celebrate Passover. Every day, more volunteers sign up to help. Thank you to all of you for volunteering your time, donating your money, and staying home and staying safe. I am Ronit Holtzman, Senior Vice President, Philanthropy and Plan Giving and Endowments. And before I turn it over to our moderator, Jeff Rosenthal, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Seidel. We really appreciate the willingness of Seidel to stay with us. And we want them to know and you to know that this relatively low cost format ensures that even more of their generous funds are supporting the needs in our community. Kola kavod. Lastly, we hope you'll join us for the next Jewish Foundation in UJA Now You Know event which will take place on April 22nd. Our panelists and moderator will discuss the stock market and what to do in these uncertain times. Now, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Jeff Rosenthal, managing partner of Imperial Capital Group, past UJA campaign chair and current co-chair of CJA. Jeff? Thanks, Ronit. Um, thanks for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. Uh, I'm going to jump right in in the interest of time. This evening, we are fortunate to have with us uh, a lineup of outstanding Canadian economists, and it's my pleasure to briefly and formally introduce them to you. Uh, first, Dr. Sherry Cooper is the Chief Economist of the Dominion Lending Centres, Canada's leading mortgage and leasing company with more than 2,600 members, offering expert advice on the issues surrounding home ownership. Dr. Cooper is an award-winning author on finance and economics and a TMX industry professor at the DeGroote School of Business. Sherry previously served as chief economist and executive vice president of the Dima Financial Group. Uh, also with us, although you can't see him, uh, is David Rosenberg. David is the chief economist and strategist at Rosenberg Research and Associates, a firm he established at the beginning of this year. He and his team assist their clients, uh, analyze, and, and provide them insight to help them make well-informed investment decisions. Immediately prior to founding this firm, David was the chief economist at Gluskin Chef uh, for 10 years, and prior to that, he was chief economist and strategist for Merrill Lynch Canada. And finally, and we hope, uh, we understand he's having some technical difficulties, but we hope to be joined by Benjamin Tal, deputy chief economist at CIBC Capital Markets. Benjamin is responsible for analyzing economic developments and their implications for North American markets. A frequent lecturer at a number of universities, he is well known for his published research on labor market dynamics, real estate, credit markets, trade and business economics. I know that the two of you and Benjamin when he, when he gets here have all been incredibly busy and in very high demand over the last uh, few weeks in particular. So we really appreciate you being here with us tonight. There are so many questions that arise from this unprecedented situation the entire world finds itself in. So the first question I'm going to ask is a very broad one, and I'll start uh, with this for David Rosenberg. David, uh, both Canada and the U.S. Fed are putting massive stimulus to work. Are they getting it right? Well, I would actually say that uh, the central banks have probably been getting it right uh, more than uh, the fiscal policy makers uh, have um, so far in terms of dealing with the crisis. Of course, the central banks... Uh, can deal with liquidity issues, uh, which both the Bank Canada uh, and the Fed have done uh, in style. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, with the Bank Canada now backstopping the commercial paper market and now the Fed uh, not quite buying everything in sight, uh, threatening to do so, but um, certainly unclogging, uh, you know, the uh, coronary that uh, the municipal bond market had a couple of weeks ago and the treasury market and, of course, credit. Uh, I think you've got to give uh, the central banks, um, I think, a thumbs up for what they've done. 
the problem is that um, the fiscal assistance has been slow to materialize and seems to be patchwork in nature. And uh, in the U.S., sadly enough, uh, the checks uh, or the uh, direct deposit uh, for people that have been told to stay at home uh, because they can't work, uh, that stimulus hasn't even started to hit yet. So there's going to be a lot of pain uh, starting uh, this quarter. So the central banks, I think, have done a, as much as they can do. Um, you know, are they going to prevent uh, an outright recession? Uh, no, they're not. Uh, but what I think their actions will do, at the very least, is prevent, you know, what economists call as a, a negative feedback loop when you get an economic shock like this in such a egregiously uh, over-leveraged economic and financial system uh, that what the central banks are trying to do, and I hope they're successful, is prevent, is prevent the knock-on effects from the shock onto bankruptcies, insolvencies, defaults, and then uh, a second an uncontrollable wave of employment and economic loss, uh, even past the point when we get uh, beyond the eye of the storm on the health situation. So the central banks, uh, I give them a tip of the hat for how they responded, how aggressively, um, but ultimately uh, to prevent um, uh, more economic pain, I think the fiscal policy makers uh, have a lot more to do. But they really haven't done anything just yet, so I think that's where the onus is going to be. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cooper, um, this seems to be a question of the duration of the quarantine in terms of how severe this really gets. And as central banks have dropped interest rates almost to zero and pushed, uh, and there has been this massive financial uh, impact uh, to help both employers and employees get through this, do they have any additional tools left to implement? What, where do they go from here? Well, it won't be through interest rates. Um, it has both central banks have said that they're not really looking to take interest rates into negative territory. It wouldn't make any difference anyway. What they're doing is what economists call quantitative easing. And as David was suggesting, they're providing liquidity. They're being the seller, I mean, the buyer of last resort for all of the different securities that the world is dumping into the markets. So the Bank of Canada is buying Government of Canada bonds. They're buying mortgage-backed securities to provide liquidity. They're supporting the commercial paper market. They're supporting the bankers' acceptance market. They're lender of last resort to the banks. And similarly, the Federal Reserve is doing the same thing at every level of government. Government. They're also um, looking to the, the global markets and the Fed especially is providing dollars for those who need it so that countries don't dump their holdings of U.S. treasuries into the market, which of course would lead to a, a big increase in interest rates. The, the central banks, I think, will continue to do whatever it takes. The fiscal policy makers, I mean, the problem there is we just don't have the technology to get the government resources out quickly enough. I mean, anybody who's tried to apply for employment insurance in Canada knows that. I mean, they're not even answering the phones any longer. Service Canada has shut down. The website isn't functioning. And as of Monday, we're going to see this new support of $2,000 a month for four months. And this support is going to have a website that opens up on Monday. Now, dollars to donuts, that website is gonna crash. And it's, you know, I'm trying to figure out for my, my housekeeper, I want to apply for her. I'm thinking of waking up at, you know, 12.01 a.m. Monday morning to start. So it's scary. And of course, overhanging all of this is the tremendous, terrifying one million plus people now are suffering from COVID-19 and Canada is certainly a part of that. Thank you. Um, I've heard it said that one of the key differences between this situation 
and previous significant uh, recessions or, or even the Great Depression is that we had a very good position from which to hand off. The economy was generally running quite well, interest rates were low, employment rates were really high, conditions could hardly have been better. Um, and so given that, we hear about the shape of a recovery, a V or a U or maybe a W or even a VW. Um, uh, given our starting point and recognizing uh, that the duration will dictate to a great degree what happens from here, could both of you give us some thoughts as to how we ultimately look when we come out of this? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, nobody knows is the truth. And that's the real answer. And the reason is because nobody knows how long this period of um, flattening the curve and isolation and shutdown of the economies will last. And I think that it's irresponsible to guess how long it will last, except to say that the province of Ontario has told us that they're expecting to continue this program until uh, the end of June. So it's not over in a couple of weeks. Um, the rebound, I think, will have more to do with how well the world is coping in a COVID-19, um, the other side of the curve, when things begin to, to slow down, whether or not the warm weather will help to reduce the number of cases, whether or not people can get the disease more than once, um, what our testing capabilities will be, how safe and secure will people feel about going outside again, and the confidence level of businesses and consumers is paramount. And so I do not think this is going to be a V-shaped recovery, but uh, we will recover. David, what's your view on that? Okay. Well, look, I, I'm sure that um, I'm sure that we will recover. Uh, the question is the timing. And uh, everybody asked me about uh, the V-shaped recovery. <laughs> this recession is just starting, and people are talking about a V-shaped recovery already, uh, which shows you how much uh, combination of hope and despair there is out there. Uh, I say the V stands for vaccine. And I think we're really past uh, everything once we actually have a vaccine for this virus, which I understand is 12 to 18 months away. Uh, so all bets are off in terms of, you know, any degree of normalcy. And I think that once we get past this, uh, we're going to have to redefine uh, a whole new normal in terms of uh, how we travel, uh, how we work, and uh, how we manage uh, our finances. Uh, because, you know, what happened here is that uh, we knew that sending people home and telling them not to work, uh, the fiscal policymakers were going to have to bribe uh, households and small businesses uh, to not open up, to stay at home. And of course, we have to have this income transfer. It's uh, not just a matter of humanity and morality. Uh, we have to do it just to put uh, some sort of floor under the economy. I don't think anybody, uh, even a few weeks ago, was thinking uh, that this was going to morph into the central banks uh, going into areas they've never done before. Like nobody had ever talked about that the Fed was ultimately actually going to become the ECB or the Bank of Japan. I mean, it's happening. Uh, we love to boast in Canada that in the 0809 crisis, the Bank of Canada maintained the sanctity of its balance sheet, never engaged in QE. Well, now it's engaged in QE. Uh, the comment that we went into this in strong shape, I just don't believe that for a second. Uh, people like to say that in the United States because they look at the stock market as the barometer of economic success, and um, that's not really true, or they look at the unemployment rate being at 3.5% and draw the conclusion, well, things are great. Uh, I could tell you that uh, the 12-month run rate on U.S. GDP and uh, the U.S. being, uh, you know, the beacon of light, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the one-eyed, the, the one-eyed uh, one man in the land of the king, in the land of the blind, um, was running barely more than 1%. I mean, we're seeing all the numbers into February in the United States from capital goods orders. Uh, to retail sales, to commercial construction, were actually pretty weak. In Canada, we had no growth going into this thing. And in fact, 30% of global GDP heading into this was actually flat to negative. 
So uh, this view that, um, you know, that we're just going to get past this and revert to where we were before, well, where we were before wasn't actually that great. And that's why Treasury yields were coming down so aggressively through most of last year. They say the bond market usually gets it right, um, and it did. Uh, now, in terms of uh, what we see going forward, uh, I just have to say, and I agree with Sherry on this, is that the only certainty is that any attempt at all here at a definitive forecast is going to fail. Uh, I think that what economists really have to do to help people make decisions is to scenario build. Um, but it's, it's, this is the most complicated situation I can remember. It's not just this health shock, but it morphed into a global supply shock, a local demand shock. We've got a layer on top of that, especially in the shale regions in the United States and, of course, in Canada, this uh, oil shock layered on top of that separately, of course, a credit shock. And we also have a, a huge wealth shock. And we have the median age of the boomer um, at 65 years old who just had a monumental hole uh, put into his or her portfolio, which is going to have a dramatic impact going forward. Once we're past the worst of the eye of the storm, is that boomers who are relying on the stock market for their retirement is they're going to have to do a lot of um, recalculations on what that's going to look like. Uh, I just say that um, I think that what the government stimulus measures are going to do and the, and the central banks uh, will help put a floor on the situation, no doubt about it. Uh, but I just don't think it's going to be enough to arrest uh, the fall that we're going to see in the real economy. Uh, I'm not looking at a V-shape right now. I'm more thinking about how deep is the downturn going to be in the second quarter? And it's going to be monumental, like on the order of, uh, of what happened in the 1930s. That's what we're looking at right now. We just had a, a jobless claim number in the United States today of 6.6 .6 million on top of 3 million plus the week before. These are, these are depression era numbers. Uh, the, worst, the worst jobless claim numbers that we had in the United States previously in 08 and 09 was 600,000. This is 10 times worse. The big question is going to be, and this will... I think if we're going to measure the success, especially of what fiscal policy will do, uh, and even monetary policy, since there's so many loan guarantees uh, and backstops to try and keep businesses alive throughout this whole thing, but businesses, a lot of them will survive, and a lot of them won't survive. And then that, the question is going to be these people that were paying to stay at home, will they have a job to go back to? You see, that is really the unknown unknown. But what we know is that the current downdraft in GDP, that you can argue the stock market already at least partially priced in, if not largely priced in, that drop in GDP this quarter is going to be severe. Uh, it's going to be global. Uh, the market's entered into this eye of the storm first. Uh, now it's the economy's turn. And the question is going to be, uh, you know, will this last into the third quarter? Will there be some spillover into the third quarter? And when you're taking a look at all the events, uh, that are being cancelled, you know, into July, uh, and not just in Toronto, but also globally. Um, Wimbledon being cancelled, for example. Uh, there's not going to be any V-shaped recovery, at least not over the, uh, I'd say, over the third or fourth quarter. Maybe at some point next year we'll get a real nice pop in GDP. But right now I think that um, the economy is heading into the eye of the storm. Uh, we still have a tremendous number of unknown unknowns regarding that. Uh, and the question is going to be, uh, you know, how these shocks play into uh, the people, the workers, and the businesses, especially small businesses, which ones are going to fail? Uh, and uh, that's going to be the really big question as we even get past the worst point of this, uh, is what are the lingering scars going to be? Uh, and I still think these are issues we'll be working on in the third and fourth quarter. Next year is really hard to say. I think next year we'll probably have a vaccine and we'll be talking about other, other things, which is life after the crisis. Uh, but I think right now we have to hunker down and realize that not just the second quarter, but the aftershocks in the third quarter are going to keep the real economy uh, here and abroad under severe strains. So I know that China we're looking at as sort of a template. And everybody looks at, oh, well, uh, Xi Jinping is saying everybody's going back to work. They're reopening the businesses but look at the retail sales in March in China. They were, they were negative 6% year on year. These are numbers in China that never go negative, and these are already numbers for March. Um, and so people may come back to work. Businesses may reopen. But you see, wide swaths of them will not. And then the next question is, even though you go back to work, 
uh, are you going to be comfortable enough to start spending money? Because spending is what goes into GDP. GDP is all about aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is about spending. 70% of that is consumer spending. And I think that the consumer, although we'll all like to go out and get haircuts uh, and go to the salon and do all that sort of stuff, there's going to be a lot of components of consumer spending that are not going to come back as quickly as a lot of people think. Well, you know, I, I've got to say I'm not as as pessimistic as David. And, you know, you think about what's happening right now. We could have an enormous baby boom in the next nine months. I mean, people are, there's pent up demand out there. And I do think that there's resiliency in Canada, in the United States, and the rest of the world. I mean, to be sure, we'll all be scarred by this, and it will have a meaningful psychological effect. But, but business and animal spirits will come back. And uh, I think it, it's sort of like the post-war period, when uh, um, people were so anxious to return to normalcy that we could see quite a substantial rebound. The question is just when. I mean, there, there are enormous amounts of capital that have been built up and sitting on the sidelines, uh, waiting for opportunities over the last six, 12, 24 months. And now they're looking out there and while leverage might not be as readily available, they're seeing all sorts of value. And, uh, to, to that end, where do you see that money going? What sectors uh, do you expect, Sherry, will be most impacted, uh, both in a short term as well as a long term basis based on uh, permanently changed behaviors uh, coming out of this socially distancing scenario? Well, you know, we were expecting in Canada prior to the pandemic a very strong spring housing market. Now, that's not going to happen in the spring because um, we all know why. But it could be a very strong fall housing market or even next spring. I mean, no one knows when, but there is pent up demand. Interest rates will remain low. Um, you know, there's right now, anybody who had their, their homes listed on the markets are removing the listings and, and people are afraid to go into physical properties and everybody's kind of deer in the headlights. But there will be a rebound in that. And yes, there will be people that will be unemployed even when all the, you know, all back to work signal is raised. But there'll be plenty of people working too. And uh, this gives people an opportunity at this point now to just make decisions. And yes, we'll tighten our belts in some ways, but in other ways, I'm not so sure. Now, what happens with the stock market? It'll gradually rebound. Just look what happened during the financial crisis. We saw disastrous movements in stocks. In this case, it, it isn't that whole sectors like the banking system is under downward pressure. In this case, it's more to do with an exogenous shock, except for the oil industry, where that definitely is battered because of the dramatic increase in oil production. Now, Trump today said that he's talked to the Saudis and to the Russians, and they're gonna get it together to reduce production. We'll see. But for sure, Alberta and the shale oil sectors in the United States have, have had an intrinsic shock to their industry. But for the rest of, of the economy, we can't wait to actually go to the movies, let alone to a restaurant. And we've only been doing this for a couple of weeks. Imagine how we're gonna feel in a couple of months. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, Trump, Trump came out early, but I'm hearing the question out there about where, where is the tipping point when the, the benefit to trying to reestablish the economy and get things working again outweighs healthcare concerns. What, where, where, where does that happen? Well, remember, he told us that we were going to go back, you know, everybody was going back to work uh, for Easter. And um, fortunately, brighter minds did talk him out of that. He'll keep saying it. Um, I have no confidence that he truly understands the severity of the situation. But I do not believe 
that the United States is going to risk the health of of its population by opening up. I, I must say what has puzzled me is Sweden, where they have not shut down and um, they have 5,500 cases and 300 odd deaths. And I just don't understand that. But I'm sure that um, as everyone is focusing on the numbers and how the numbers of cases are doubling in two days or three days or four days, <laughs> that that's got to wake people up to the severity of the situation. David, perhaps I could ask you to talk uh, about our, you know, our key trading relationships and how they fare through this crisis and coming out of it uh, with the US, with China, Mexico. Well, I mean, that's, uh, out of all the questions, I mean, that's probably the least relevant from where I'm sitting right now. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, I, I can't see why our relationships with the U.S. or Mexico are going to change. I think global relations with China may change, and I think that global supply chains, especially as it pertains to um, things that are essential uh, that we're finding out now that uh, so much of the world's production of uh, vaccines and uh, medical masks uh, and the like uh, are in, uh, in Asia, uh, in China. I guess that's one area perhaps where Donald Trump is probably right. I think you're going to find in some areas, uh, global supply chains broken and um, and become more localized. Uh, you know, I, I want to go back to something that was discussed earlier, which I think is really way more important, which is, uh, you know, this view that there's a tremendous amount of pent-up demand and that we're going to get through this, and I'm sure that we will. Um, we have to consider more what, what really what the aftershocks are. We, we have to answer the question why it is that the central banks, we can understand why there would have to be a fiscal policy response and an income transfer uh, from uh, the government to the people uh, that they basically said, you have to stay at home and you can't work. I don't know anybody, including myself, that was talking about uh, the central banks. I mean, the, the Fed is becoming a direct lender. The Fed has hired BlackRock as mm -hmm. their partner. This is unbelievable. Uh, and so why is it that the central banks, why the Bank of Canada has to backstop through the commercial paper market, basically the Canadian credit market? What's that all about? And that's about uh, something that was said earlier, which I don't agree with. We came into this situation with liquidity conditions incredibly strained. There was leverage on this cycle applied onto leverage. Household balance sheets in Canada uh, are more stretched than they were in the U.S. at the credit bubble peak of 2006. In fact, uh, corporate balance sheets in both the U.S. and Canada are the most strained in terms of excessive debt than they ever have been. And we know what happened this cycle. It was a cycle where rates were low, so the math made sense to use every possible dollar of your proceeds, including the Trump tax cuts, and buy back your stock to the point where the S&P 500 share count went down to a 20-year low. Uh, that was the bull market was in financial engineering. So when I'm looking at the data, I don't get there's pent-up demand. What I get is that there was a shortage of cash at every level of society and in the markets. In fact, you look at the equity market, portfolio managers in the United States on the equity side went into this with a record low 2% cash to asset ratio. Cash was a dirty four-letter word. I actually think we come out of this, not with a lot of pent-up demand. We might have initially uh, a pop. But I think there's going to be a whole reappraisal as to how households uh, and how businesses approach their inventories, how they approach their cash position, and how they approach their leverage and their balance sheets. That is going to be a secular shift. Uh, if you ask me about, you know, where the investable ideas are, uh, well, you know, they're, uh, they're out there. I think that if you're looking at the uh, U.S. Treasury market right now, and I'm talking especially about the 30-year Treasury yield. Uh, when you look at it, where it is benchmarked against the overnight rate, it might be the cheapest long-term government bond market in the world. I like long-term Treasuries. Uh, now that the Fed is backstopping credit in general, uh, I think that um, short-term investment-grade bonds aren't a bad place to be. Uh, and what I also like is I like the babies that were thrown out uh, with the bathwater. Uh, I mean, because you have so much concern that people aren't going to pay the utility bills, utility stocks of all things, well, went down 50% just in the past few weeks. 
uh, their yields are tremendous. Uh, even if they uh, have to ultimately cut their dividend, there's tremendous protection there. I would say telecom uh, with strong balance sheets, the ones that have financial depth. And I'd say once again, BBO with the bathwater are uh, the REITs, especially the REITs in Canada, which have great yields. Um, and, um, and I think have great downside protection, even if you know, people decide I'm going to not pay my rent for the next couple of months. I think the what I call uh, big cap safety uh, that have a yield uh, are good places to start to uh, pick away at here. Would you that include the banks in that list, David? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 I, I, I like the Canadian banks uh, more than I like the U.S. banks. And the U.S. banks right now are, are being asked to be the conduit uh, to uh, extend um, shaky loans to the private sector to keep them alive and well. The Canadian banks, um, I think, have uh, much stronger yields, obviously. Uh, so you have a lot of protection. Uh, we've got to cross our fingers that the dividends don't get cut. Um, but the problems I have with the banks in general, and I'd say this globally, and of course we all hear about how great capitalized the U.S. banking system is. I hear that over and over again. That's great. That's already well known. Uh, we're not fighting the last war here. This is about debt, a debt bubble outside of the banking system. This is not 08 or 09. Uh, but the problems with the banks is the earnings visibility. Uh, you know, and I say that you know the capital. Capitalization of the banks, great shape. But ultimately, you do want to buy companies in general, including the banks, uh, for their uh, earning stream. And I think that what's happened here with the North American banks, including Canada, is that they're being re-rated for a much lower ROE environment because we have to face facts here. If one thing that is certain, even once we get past the worst point of this crisis, central banks are not going to monkey around with interest rates. Uh, interest rates were low before, they're going to be microscopic. We're all following in Japan's footsteps. I guess Europe followed Japan, and now North America followed Europe. But when interest rates are zero at the front end, and you have a completely flat yield curve, achieving net interest margins in the banking sector are going to be very difficult. And I think that's why the banks have had some difficulty here. But I'd say this much, uh, the yields uh, are very attractive, so you do have a lot of protection there. Um, moving uh to the, the massive deficits that are being racked up to, to keep this economy al alive, or at least on, on life support. How, how does this ever get paid back? Are we looking at massive tax increases in the near term or midterm, or are we just gonna push this out in, onto future generations or some combination? I think that I, it's a different answer for Canada versus the US. Um, one thing that is true is Canada went into this with much lower debt to GDP, level than the United States. And, uh, but even for the US, which has already had record high debt levels um, to relative to the economy, as high as in the, you know, that World War II, um, the, the US has the advantage of being the, the global uh, currency. And so there is some truth to the fact that um, the U.S. will be rated AAA and a safe haven. And clearly right now, um, the, the bond market, if David says the bond market's always right, well, the bond market has told us that there's just a, a, a huge demand for U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, so the deficits, I don't think that the government should allow budgetary deficit concerns to stop them from providing a cushion to the damage that the pandemic has done. Um, when we get out of this, I think, uh, then it, it's a different world altogether, and we'll look at that. I, I don't think raising taxes will be the answer. It, I think the, we'll need to see ways that productivity improves so that we get a boost in GDP. David, do you yeah, I'll that? just follow up with that, if I could, that um, firstly, deficits always balloon in a recession because uh, revenues go down, uh, the automatic spending stabilizers go up. Uh, this deficit is uh, being compounded um, by the fact that the government is going to be uh, writing checks 
to the household sector uh, as a bribe to be good citizens and stay home, and as you're not getting paid your paycheck, um, we're going to do an income transfer. And, of course, they're doing other things with the business sector more aggressively in the United States uh, than than in Canada, although this should be done in Canada, which is you try your best to, I won't call it even bridge loans, it's more like bridge assistance uh, with another bribe, which is that this will be a a forgivable loan uh, if if you actually hang on to your staff levels. Um, So this is, these are all aimed at preserving stability, I'd say social stability, because it's not normal to tell people not to go to work. What we're doing right now, so this, this uh, social distancing, as Sherry had said, I mean, this is, this is really uh, goes so much against uh, our cultural and social fabric, especially in North America, we're social beings. We have to pay people to stay home, but you see, this isn't like a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, like, like, a like a tax cut uh, that's permanent. Uh, that's a permanent shock to the government balance sheet. Uh, once people ultimately come back to work, not all of them will, but once we get past this, and it might be 12 or 24 months, nobody really knows. Um, I, I do believe that once we get the vaccine and that will come, uh, things are going to come back really quickly. Uh, on that score with Sherry, I totally agree on. I just don't think that it's going to happen a lot much before then. I think that behavior is going to be such that the economy is going to be held back. But uh, I don't think that we should jump to the conclusion that these are permanent increases in the deficit. Okay, um, This is basically to tide us. It could be six months or 12 months. Let's hope it's not longer than that. So the deficits in the out years, uh, 2021, 22, the deficits will be coming down. Now, if I'm wrong on that and these deficits prove to be permanent, then you're quite right. There's only two ways to solve it. You either have to raise taxes, and I don't think it's going to be on future generations. I think it will be on the current generation. But then again, I don't think any government is going to be raising taxes. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think what's more likely to happen, uh, if it comes to that, that these deficits prove to be um, unsustainably high for longer, uh, and we're seeing it already, I think that – you know, that what we were calling modern monetary theory or outright debt monetization, basically the buyer of these bonds, the buyer of all these bonds, not just government bonds, uh, will all reside on the Fed's balance sheet and they will stay there at a perpetuity. Um, And that's where at some point, not next year, the year after, but at some point, four, five, six years down the road, uh, you know, once we're past this deflationary savings glut, we will end up with a lot more inflation uh, than people can envisage right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's maybe something that the gold market maybe told you today, uh, but that's another great hedge against that prospect. But I think the answer to this, and we're seeing it already, is that this will come back on central bank balance sheets and primarily the Fed. Okay, thank you. Um, Sherry, um, for homeowners with mortgages, and nearing a point where they need to refinance or for those who reflect in the mortgage rates, but in fact, it, it hasn't been reflected to the consumer um, and it's been pretty stable uh, as rates. Can you comment on this and what your expectations are going forward at the consumer level and how people should you know, think about refinancing their home or buying a new home today? Right, well, I mean, mortgage rates had been coming down and interest rates by all historical measures are extremely low. What was surprising to many and what seemed very odd was in the last month and even in the last three weeks when the Bank of Canada cut interest rates over and over and over again and took rates down to near zero, we actually saw an uptick in some mortgage rates. And, and that was because the cost of funds to banks has increased very sharply. And as David mentioned, with a very flat yield curve, the interest rate spreads are very tight. And the banks just can't afford to, um, to price variable rate loans, for example, off of a 2.45% prime rate with a 100 basis point discount, which is what was in existence when the prime was at 3.95, which was only a month ago. 
Um, so, but, but those spreads may actually, and some of them actually have started to come down in terms of, of cost of funds for the banks because the central bank, again, Bank of Canada is in there supporting the mortgage market, supporting the bankers acceptance and commercial paper markets. So uh, I sure don't think mortgages, mortgage rates are gonna rise much. Um, now, how much more could they fall? Well, I mean, it's anybody's guess during the recession, but part of the reason there is a recession is because people are out of work. And if they're out of work, whether it's voluntarily or not voluntarily, they're not gonna be buying homes. So once this, whether it's the vaccine or just um, uh, there could be medicines that um, treat the coronavirus before then, whatever it takes to, uh, for us to return to a new normal, and I do think it will be different, that new normal, I think that interest rates will remain low. So from the perspective of uh, people who are um, renewing their mortgages, I mean, interest rates are still very, very low. And whether or not you want to consider variable rates, well, variable rate mortgages now are cheaper. The interest rate is lower than most fixed rate mortgages. If you believe interest rates will continue to decline, and that's a bet on what happens over the next three, five years, because most people actually don't keep the same mortgage or remain in the house for that long. Um, if, if you've got nerves of steel, then by all means, go variable. Personally, I'm, I'm more risk averse than that. Okay. Thank you. I see we've overcome our technical difficulties and we're joined by Benjamin oh, Powell. Hello. Hey, hi. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> So, so Benjamin, you're, you're on the seat and, and we've gone through a number of questions, but maybe we could just uh, ask you to give us some thoughts on what you're seeing and perhaps in your comments, you could talk on the, uh, about the Canadian dollar and, and what you what you see in the future coming down for, for that. Yes, the Canadian dollar is the least of our problems at this point. We have much uh, bigger things to worry about. Uh, you know, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve just said the other day that we might be in a recession. <laughs> this is the understatement of the, of the century. You know, we are in a deep recession, deep recession. We are talking about the GDP growth uh, this quarter of basically negative 25 to 30 percent on an annual basis. We have never seen anything like that in our lifetime. And as I'm sure you discussed, we also have never seen this policy response and. Uh, I know that you discuss a little bit policy, but I think that the central bank and to an extent even the, the, the government of Canada, their reaction function was fantastic, fantastic dealing with this situation. And it's not over. This is just the beginning, of course. The central bank has unlimited uh, way and uh, capacity to deal with the situation. I think that the government is doing a good job as, and more to come. A few things that I would like to say. We have to remember one thing. The next quarter is a given, it's down dramatically. Some people are comparing it to the Great Depression. I think we have to be careful, even if it's not 2008 in this sense, that the difference is that in 1929 and even in 2008, when you went down, you went down, there was nothing beneath you. It was a free fall, there was no bottom. This crisis as an end game, the end game is a vaccine. We all know that. And it's a question of time, not if, when. And in between, we have two layers of defense. One is the uh, social distancing. The other is antiviral medication that will come two or three months from now, as some experts are telling us. So what we are doing, all of us, governments, central banks, banks, individuals, and companies, we are simply buying time. We are buying time until we reach this point. And that's why the reaction function of those people who lose their jobs is very different. There is a big difference between losing your job in 2008, 1991, when you don't know what to do, you have to start working on your resume. And today, the vast majority of people that get EI today, they know that they, their job is waiting for them. Some of them will not have a job, but the vast majority will have a job waiting for them. This cubicle is waiting for them. They are not, they're there, they are just on hold. 
So we are frozen. This is a big difference in the reaction curve. And that's why what the government is doing, what uh, central banks are doing is just buying time. We have to understand this uh, mechanism because I think it's very, very important. And that will determine where this market is going. And I know that uh, you discussed markets. I really was not listening. I couldn't. But uh, I believe that uh, I'm trying to picture our life three or four months from now. Not the next quarter, or, because we know more or less what's waiting. Three or four months from now. Clearly, it would be better than it is now. But it will not be a green light by any stretch of the imagination. We all know that. And the way I see it is the following. The older people, people with preconditions, they will be asked to stay home. Um, companies will be encouraged to keep as many people as they can working from home. So many of us will still be working from home three, four, five months from now. And then uh, you will see factories going back to semi-normal, which shifts flexible hours to minimize um, engagement. Same goes for uh, other facilities. Construction will continue at reduced level, lower productivity. Personal services will be a problem. So it will take a long time and it will, be, it will not be normal, but it will be better than the next quarter. So we see GDP, for example, in the third or fourth quarter, starting to go to positive from a negative 25-30. It's not a V-shaped recovery by any stretch of the imagination. We still have a lot, of, a lot of time, but for the first time, I think by July, August, we will feel that we are not totally defenseless against that virus. That's the way I see the trajectory of events unfolding. Thank you. We've been asked some questions by, by participants on the call uh, who submitted them prior to the call uh, about the impact on specific industries and changing behaviors as we, as we ultimately go, as we go through it and ultimately come out of this, uh, this phase. Um, will supply chains, in your opinion, become uh, more domestic in nature? Uh, will we rely less heavily on offshore supply suppliers? Uh, absolutely. I think that deglobalization started with Trump, and this virus is accelerating the process in a very significant way. When you wake up and realize that 90% of antibiotic consumption in the U.S. is coming uh, from China, you know that something is wrong. So we know that this will change in a big way. Governments and companies will rethink their supply situation, supply chain uh, situation, and that's something that will change this uh, globalization story. It will not be, it will not, we will not reverse globalization. We, you cannot do that. But we are already starting to see the emergence of two trading blocks, China and its friends, and the US and its friends, with major implications for Canada's small open economy. You know, before the crisis, I had a meeting with the finance minister about diversifying our uh, export engine because uh, we, Canada, we have um, trade agreements with 41 countries. We are the most connected country in the universe. We are very good in signing agreements. <laughs> And we have a situation in which, despite all those agreements, our reliance on the U.S. is exactly the same as it was 10 years ago. And the minister said, we are going to put $4 billion. Back then, it was a lot. Now it's around the euro. $4 billion towards diversifying our export machine. And I said, be careful now. Because, you know, in the past, it was future. It, it was very clear, you know, in, in the future. You, you have the situation in which you just sold to whoever was willing to buy. Now you have to make sure that they are in the right side of the globe. Your okay. friends, we, we have, that's we something have a, very, very different. We have to think about it. So export diversification is becoming much more complex, but you're absolutely right. This is the beginning of deglobalization and the changing of globalization as we know it with major implications. Some of them will be inflationary. One of the big questions that we're getting, and this is for any of you or all of you that we're getting from participants, is the impact of this on the traditional commercial real estate sector. Will we view and use real estate the way that we have been, or are we all going to be so well connected remotely uh, that it will result in a permanent change and a drop in the need for the same amount of commercial real estate? Will we see a permanent drop in that market? We've already seen a trend toward more flexible workspace and people working wherever they are. And remember, it wasn't just from 
working from home, but working from hotel rooms and, and you know, conferences and wherever the world took us. Uh, there's no question in my mind that, uh, that people will learn how to work from home, those who can, and those who can, by the way, are the fortunate ones, because if you're a, a, a server in a restaurant or a hairdresser, uh, you, or even a dentist, you can't work from home. Uh, but for those of us who can, it's, it's, uh, we won't go back to the old way. I think we've seen that though, many companies, companies, my niece worked, used to work for Twitter. She was expected to work from home most of the time. And, you know, many companies now consider that to be relatively normal. So there will be that effect. Now, people still like to be with people, and you still need to have face-to-face. -face. For years, I thought I wouldn't have to travel as much as I used to to give speeches because I could do the whole thing remotely. But they still want your physical presence on that stage. And that human-to-human -human contact, that I do not think will change. No, let me just say something about uh, multi-residentials, and actually it's uh, today what's happening, just to update uh, the listeners uh, regarding what's happening with rent, because I think it's very important. You know, we are taking care of eventually of mortgage uh, borrowers through deferrals, so we are giving deferrals for small businesses. I know it's complicated, but they're getting it, they will get the 75% uh, wage subsidy, which is a lot of money, $71 billion, a lot happening in this space. One thing that is not happening yet in terms of a solution is rentals. 25% uh, of uh, Canadians are renting, and that's clearly the multi-residential aspect of commercial banking. Now, just to uh, update you on what's uh, cooking, uh, there is the possibility that um, there will be some sort of an arrangement in which a tenant uh, will submit a declaration to the landlord, this declaration, one, one page, which will be a legal document saying, I lost my job, I need this break, 20, 30, 40% after EI, I do need this break in uh, rent. The landlord will make sure that it's all kosher, take it and will submit it to the province. The province will pay directly to the landlord. That's what's cooking now, whatever, whatever is missing, and when the fog clears and the tenant uh, uh, resume employment and income, uh, the government, the province will deal directly with the tenant through the tax system. And if they cannot deal with it, it will be forgotten. That's what's cooking now behind the scenes. We don't know if the province will go with it. Clearly they're showing interest. That's something that is extremely important from the multi-residential aspect in the near future. Large companies can deal with uh, you know, not getting uh, rent for a while. Smaller operations cannot do that. And that's something that uh, is missing from the solution cocktail that we have seen. So that's very interesting. But overall, I think that um, the office market will change a little bit. I think that this is a long-term impact beyond many other uh, changes, absolutely. Uh, David, in a recent- Jeff, can I weigh in uh, on an answer to that? Please. So uh, I actually, uh, I do agree with what Sherry said uh, on this topic. I mean, I think that, you know, because you, you hear all sorts of stories about that everybody wants uh, to work at home now. Uh, I could tell you that uh, my staff, everybody who's remote, they can't wait to get back to the office. Uh, Sherry had mentioned earlier that the birth rate is uh, going to create a lot of uh, pent-up demand, you know, uh, maybe for uh, for diapers and, uh, um, and the like, but uh, the birth rate's going up and so is the divorce rate uh i think that uh, i think that uh people you know i mean people are not going to want to stay cooped up working out of their home office everybody now will have a home office maybe you'll work out of it a day or two a week but this notion uh that oh that this is going to on a secular basis impair commercial real estate is um uh you know i, I just don't know where that comes from uh so uh you heard all sorts of horror stories also about Nobody wanted to work in office towers after 9/11. Well, that never happened either. I mean, that, that's. I mean, there's lots of secular changes that are going to happen, um, but the implications for office real estate down the road is going to be infinitesimal. The only problem is in Toronto, there the traffic. You can't get to downtown offices. Today you can. Right. <laughs>
Today you can. Sure, you'll have to learn to take the subway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, David, in the recent yeah, editorial, you, 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 uh, you wrote that, you know, you expected personal services, services to come back fairly strongly in hospitality, uh, you know, healthcare, retail, et cetera. Um, this was last week. Do you still, do you still feel that way? Uh, I think that, um, well, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I didn't, I didn't actually want to come on camera so that you could see me with this, uh, this, um, th this beard that makes me look like a rabbi and my, my hair makes me look like Albert Einstein. I mean, the thing is that the first thing I'm going to do is go get a haircut. And so I think that there's going to be, yes, there will be, um, definitely an initial rush towards doing, towards buying stuff that, uh, on the service side that um, that we would do in a heartbeat, uh, you know, so and I would even include restaurants in there. Um, but uh, without a vaccine and let's say that all the numbers start looking better, the case count and the number of deaths. And, you know, what you hope is that before the vaccine comes and barring, you know, any uh, any treatment, if we start to ease uh, the social distancing, uh, you want to be a little bit careful, okay, because what you're going to hear about over and over again is the second wave in 1918. There's so much still about this virus that we don't know. Um, so I expect that restaurants, for example, will have fewer tables. Uh, I think that we'll have uh, baseball this summer, but there'll be nobody in the stands. Uh, so things will gradually uh, come back. Um, but yeah, but I think that you'll see an initial an initial pop. It's not a, it's not really a V-shaped recovery. It's really you know as Bennett said, when you go down 25% at an annual rate, uh, and then and then you rebound 10% off of that, it's not a V. It's like a, a left-handed check mark, and that's probably what you're going to see. And then followed by a bunch of lowercase Ws. That's what the economic life is going to look like until a vaccine comes. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, there's going to be some select services that we're all dying to, uh, to go to, uh, the barber shopping, one of them, or the salon that is going to see activity very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is now 9.02. We've gone a little bit over uh, the, the message. I know we could all sit here and listen to you uh, and your opinions uh, for, for much more time, but I've been told that uh, we, we already get off at, at nine and end the call. Uh, it seems that we all agree that the key is finding the vaccine and getting it distributed to people, and that will begin the road to recovery. Um, so I would like to thank the three of you for, uh, for appearing this evening and giving us your thoughts and opinions. Uh, and your insight. Uh, and on behalf of UJ Federation of Greater Toronto, I'd like to thank all of you on the line for participating this evening. And we wish and hope that all of you uh, and your families stay healthy uh, as Passover comes about. Um, this, this call has been recorded and it will be posted uh, sometime tomorrow on both the UJA website as well as on the social media feeds. Uh, and with that, again, thank you very much. Have a great evening and uh, look forward to being with you all again. Have a good night. Thank you.